Good evening. Take your Bibles with me, please. Turn to the New Testament book of Mark. I'm used to preaching to young people. Young people as in under 18. Don't read too far into that. I get to preach to the teens a lot. I get to preach um, uh, on Wednesdays. I get to preach elementary chapel, and that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing, preaching to elementary kids, because you've got to... Uh, it's tough, and it's different, but um, it's a blast. I have a lot of fun doing it, and, and um, you know, with kids, a lot of times, it's just remembering facts, and if they can remember the facts, and they can learn a list, then maybe they can remember what went along with it, but more often than not, sometimes they remember the things you don't want them to remember, and I remember preaching to some juniors in Michigan, and I used an illustration of uh, some wrestling or something like that, and that is all the boys took home from that junior church. And I had parents asking me, how come you're teaching our children to wrestle in junior church? And I had to explain that took up about 30 seconds worth of the whole time I had. Um, this morning, this morning in Sunday school, I used, I used the phrase, and um, I used the phrase, worthless piece of garbage. And I'm sure that the teens in Sunday school this morning, that's all they took away from this morning, was that phrase. Uh, don't ever use that at each other or on each other or anything. Well, it's the New Testament book of Mark. Uh, let's go to uh, chapter 5. I was, I was looking over my notes a minute ago, and um, we want to look at verses 1 through 20, but for some reason I read it wrong, and it looked like it said verse 20 through whatever, 30. And so I, I started reading it. I'm like, oh, man, this is not my text. Uh, but I was reading too far beyond it. Anyway, go to, go to verse 1, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says this, And they came over onto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, and I was talking about Christ here, when Christ had come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was, now there, was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that it was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him, howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. Let's pray. Lord God, I do thank you for tonight. And I thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to read your word, to maybe be drawn to a familiar story of the New Testament. But God, I pray that this wouldn't just be uh, monotonous for us, looking at a passage we've seen so many times. But God, I pray that we would see the application, we'd see the principles that you're holding forth for us. God, I pray that you would change our lives even this evening. For your name I pray. Amen. What is ministry? What is ministry? Now, if this was elementary chapel, I'd have 20 answers already. She just shouted out at me. And I'd have one little girl who always raises her hand. And uh, she doesn't know the answer when she raises her hand, but eventually she figures it out when she talks herself through it. It takes a while, but she talks herself through it and she figures it out. Does a pretty good job. Alexis. Anyway. 
I'm telling the teachers who it is. They know. What is ministry? You don't have to answer out loud. Ministry can be defined as caring for or attending to or looking after or waiting upon someone. A lot of times we think of ministry, we think of ministers, pastors, preachers, uh, priest, rabbi. They're ministers. But I submit that ministry and ministers has to do with all of us, all of us Christians. The American Heritage Dictionary defines ministry as simply the act of serving. I want to talk about ministry tonight. I want to talk about proper preparation for ministry. I have preached through this message before in this church. My wife said, you can't, you can't double up on a message. Um, this was, uh, man, this, when, when Teen Week comes up this year, it'll be two years ago when I preached this. Uh, the very first time I preached in this church was the evening before Teen Week, before my wife and I had even uh, gotten the call to come here and had prayed about it and, and decided that this was the, where the Lord wanted us. So it was a long time ago when I shared this. If you have a good memory, you'll remember. If you don't, then, oh well, listen up, you'll learn something new again tonight. All right, the act of serving. From a biblical perspective, ministry means serving God and serving others. Did you catch that? Ministry is serving God and serving others others. I lost my spot. God has called us out to be his ministers. This is not merely a suggestion, but rather it's commanded in scripture. The very essence of being a true follower of Christ has to do directly with ministering or ministry. Go to Matthew uh, chapter 20. I want to show you something here. Matthew chapter 20 and verses 26 through 28. The Bible says this, but it shall not be so among you. This is Jesus Christ talking. I know that because uh, my Bible has it in red print. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your what? Servant. Minister, servant, yes. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even, listen to this, as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And Christians who are supposed to be imitating Christ are also called out to minister unto people. Not just to be ministered to, but to minister to serve other people. Hey, it's the Bible way. It's Christ's example. Furthermore, I would contend that many of the commands given in Scripture by Christ, really directly to our ministering, consider just a few commands of Christ. Matthew 5, 16, Christ says, Let your light so shine before men that what? They may see your good works. All right, take the cue, all right, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's ministry. Matthew 5, 44, the verse tells us to love our enemies. That's ministry. That is serving. It's hard enough to love in the first place, but to love your enemy? Who's your enemy? Some of us got a lot of enemies. Some of us got a few. Some of us have people we don't like or we dislike. That's your enemy, all right? Not necessarily because they hate you, but you've made them your enemy. The Bible says love your, love your enemy, and there's a reason Christ reminds us to do that. He says love your enemy because if you love your enemy, uh, then that person will not be your enemy after time. You will grow to love them. Doesn't matter what they do to you. Doesn't matter what they say to you. Doesn't matter what they say behind your back. You will love that person no matter what. It's an unconditional type of love there. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38 the Bible reminds us to pray for laborers. That's ministry. Praying for other people. That is ministry. Praying for laborers. That's ministry. That's serving. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, the Bible reminds us and tells us, Christ commands us to forgive those who have offended us. That's a big word there. Not many of us know what that means. Forgive. That is ministry. That is having a servant's heart, forgiving people who have offended us. You mean that I, if I've done nothing wrong and somebody does something wrong to me, I got to forgive that person? You better betcha you need to forgive that person. That's the command in Scripture to forgive those who have offended you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. 
Christ commands us to make disciples. That, my friends, is ministry. A command was given to Christ's disciples. That's what we need to be doing, is making disciples. The Great Commission is simple. Go ye therefore and teach all nations or make disciples, baptizing them therefore in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And the next verse is great. Christ says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. And I left off the first part where Christ said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. That's what my memory does for me. So that's ministry. And those are just a few examples of what ministry is. So let me ask you this. Why don't we do it? Why don't we minister? Why don't we serve? Why don't we love our enemies? Why don't we forgive other people? Why don't we go and make disciples? Why don't we do it? Why do we make excuses not to do it? Why do we hope someone else will volunteer so that we don't have to do it? Why do we consider ourselves useless? Why do we render ourselves unworthy to accomplish the task at hand? Why do we say, surely God would not want me to do this? I think we reason that way in our minds for two reasons. Number one, because we don't have a correct view of the power of God to change us and to use us. We don't minister because we don't have a correct view of the power of God to change us and to use us. And I think, secondly, we don't minister because we're not properly prepared for ministry. When Christ got to Gadara, the Bible says he was immediately met by a man who was possessed with demons. Not just one or two demons, but many. A man said his name was Legion. Now, if the word Legion... Has any, is any indicator of how many demons this man was possessed with. We see that when the demons were, or the devils were sent to the swine, how many were there? It was about 2,000, it says. But if the word legion itself, that's an old uh, term, uh, and it's used uh, to, what's the word I'm looking for? It's used uh, in defining a, a piece of the Roman army. A legion was anywhere from three to 6,000 men in a troop or in a unit. So if that word legion is any indicator of how many demons this man was possessed with, it would have meant that he was possessed with a lot. A lot. Talk about hopeless. Talk about worthless. Talk about unusable. This man would have been the poster child for what many consider to be worthlessness. Let me tell you something. If God could take a man like this and use him, he can use you. I hope you realize that. I hope you understand that. And if God could change and use a murderer like Saul, if he could use a prostitute like Mary Magdalene, if he could use an adulteress like the woman at the well, and if he could use a loudmouth and short-tempered man like Peter, God can change and God can use you. Read through Scripture. Look at the people that God used. Look at the people that God used. Were they perfect? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Have you forgotten who and what you were before God found you? Consider the Old Testament. When you go there, you'll see time and again where the Lord or a prophet will stand before the children of Israel and he'll say this, Remember. Remember, children of Israel. In fact, when you go to Judges chapter 6 and verse 8, uh, we see a prophet declaring the word of the Lord, and he says this, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Now understand that Old Testament Egypt is a picture of the world in sin, and God keeps reminding the children of Israel, remember where you were before I did a marvelous work and a wonderful work in your life. Remember how you were, because I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. Have you forgotten the power of God that brought you out of the house of bondage? Have you forgotten that he who the Son sets free is free indeed? John chapter 8, verse 36. Have you forgotten Galatians 5, 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ 
hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Go to 1 Corinthians with me, if you would, please. It's going to take us a while to get to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now understand that the Corinthian church was, Corinth was in a location to where a lot of people, a lot of different people, a lot of different religions, a lot of immoral people would travel through and they would, uh, they trade in Corinth and uh, they brought their wickedness with them and the Corinthian church was a pretty, pretty, um, pretty substandard church for the day, we'll say. And that's, that's kind of saying it nice. Um, in fact, uh, the word Corinthian, if, if used, uh, it was kind of like calling someone a bad name. Um, people would, uh, if somebody called you a Corinthian, you knew that they were calling you a bad name. That's the reputation Corinth had. And Paul talks to the Corinthian church here in Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want to look specifically at uh, verses 9 through 11. The Bible says this. I've got the wrong verse. I knew this was going to happen. I'm in 2 Corinthians. There we go. First Corinthians chapter 6. All right, I can read my writing. All right, First Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. The Bible says this. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And look at verse 11. It says, And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. And the Corinthians had a problem. They couldn't and they wouldn't let go of their past. And I think we as Christians struggle with the same thing. And many of us have a past that we wrestle with every day. And we say, I can't minister. God can't use me. I'm terrible. I see, I have this past. And it's a pretty bad past. Or I've done things in the past. Or I've seen things, or I've, I've done things I shouldn't do, and God can't use me. I watched one of my mentors, a man named Leonard Saunders. He's my wife's pastor since she was in what, fourth grade or four years old, something like that, since she was a little girl. I watched him go through a bout with depression. Now, understand, this man's a pastor. You know what his problem was? Sitting in his study, studying for sermons week in and week out, he wrestled with the fact that... Uh, he didn't believe that he could preach to the people because of the way his life was before he was saved. See, he, uh, he grew up in California. I like the guy. He grew up in California and uh, went as a freshman to Maranatha Baptist Bible College back in 1968, back when the doors opened, and he was unsaved. And uh, man, it was culture shock for him when he got to Wisconsin. I feel him there. I was culture shocked when I went to Wisconsin. Nothing but a bunch of cows everywhere. Um, we'll leave that alone. Um, but he got saved his first week of school. And what, 30, 30 some odd years later, he's struggling because he doesn't understand how God could use him to minister unto people and to tell them that their lives are wrong when he himself was saved out of that. Well, you know what he came to realize? That was all the more reason to preach to people about how to live right. So he had been there. He had seen it. He had done that. And I'm not saying that's our excuse to go out and do everything we can do. But we should all go out and get drunk so we can tell people not to get drunk. That's not what I'm saying at all. Please do not even go there. But he finally realized that he was called to minister and that he was able to minister. And Paul here reminds the Corinthians, hey, look where you were before God saved you, but you have been changed. And I think one of our biggest hang-ups for ministering is that we just, we just haven't come to terms with the fact that we have been changed. The old man is put away. You say, okay, Pastor Mike, I get it. I was a filthy, rotten sinner. Now I'm saved. I know that I'm supposed to be ministering. I'll try a little harder. Uh, 
I get your point. No, I think you missed the point. Let me give you this illustration. In 1485, Hernando Cortez was born in a small town in Spain. By 1518, he had already been a soldier, a farmer, and a sailor. Upon the discovery of Mexico in 1518, Cortez was hand-selected to build a colony in Mexico. On April 21st, 1519, he landed near the site of Veracruz. There, to prevent all thought of retreat, he burned his ships. Now here's the point of that little illustration. Cortez was making a bold statement to his men. He was saying, forget about the life you knew and focus on now. He was saying, forget what is behind and look forward to what is ahead. The challenge is simple, and we haven't even got to our text yet. The challenge is simple, saved person. Burn the ship. Let it go. Your past is behind you. God has brought you out of it, and he has said you are a new person. You're brand new. So stop lying in the ditch, crying about where you used to be. Get up and start serving God. I think one of the most powerful texts in the New Testament is the one where the Apostle Paul was preaching. And he came to a city, and people came from other cities where he had been. They stirred up the crowd, and they stoned him. They stoned him so bad that they thought he was dead. The Bible says, "Howbeit he rose up. And the next day, he departed in a derby, a lystra, Iconium, preaching the word. See, the Apostle Paul got hit pretty hard. And he could have just laid there and cried. He could have just laid there and said, God, I give up. Everywhere I go, I'm getting stoned or shipwrecked or bitten by a snake or whatever, thrown in jail, I give up. But he didn't. He persevered. He kept going. He dropped that baggage behind him, and he continued serving the Lord. So drop your baggage behind you, and let's learn how to minister. Let's learn how to be properly prepared for ministry. Understand this. God will use the broken life of an individual when they're fully surrendered to him. So let's learn about that. Uh, we can be properly prepared for ministry, and by the power of God, we can also be successful in serving others for his glory. With a changed position, a changed personality, and a changed passion, we will not only learn how to prepare ourselves for ministry, but will ultimately grow closer to God through our efforts. So the question, how can I be properly prepared for ministry? See, all that was just preliminary stuff, and I've got 10 minutes left. So either I'm going to talk really fast, or we're going to be here an extra half hour. Um, I would take a vote, but I'm sure I know which way you'd vote. So uh, listen quickly. Um, <laughs> How can I be properly prepared for ministry? I think there's three ways found in our, in our text back in, back in um, the book of uh, Mark. Mark chapter 5. First of all, proper preparation for ministry involves a changed position. I want to look specifically at the man, this demon-possessed man. I want you to understand what type of a person he was. I mean, we've already said that he was demon-possessed, I mean, but look at this guy's problems. If this guy was alive today, he'd be on government aid for, for being a mental case. He'd be diagnosed bipolar. He would, he'd be diagnosed ADD or ADHD or something like that. Okay, look at this guy. Um, he dwelt among the tombs. Okay, that's weird. All right. He dwelt among the tombs. The Bible says no man could bind him because he'd often been bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetter is broken in pieces. How many of you guys have ever been tied up with chains and broken through them? Not me either. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's a little weird. Um, and always, uh, oh, the Bible says no man, in verse 4, no man could tame him. He was uncontrollable. He was out of control. Verse 5, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying. All right? Not crying as in like boo-hoo. Not necessarily. I mean, he probably did some of that too. But imagine going to sleep at night. Everything's quiet. And here you got, hear this guy in the tombs screaming at the top of his lungs all night long. All day, all night. The Bible says he was cutting himself with stones. Talk about depressed. Talk about a man with a hard life. But notice when you move down a few verses... After Christ has cast out these demons, after they've gone into the swine, 
after the people leave to go and tell everyone what was done, and after everyone comes back to see what was done, verse 15 says, And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So notice his position. Where is this man at? He's with Christ, and he's sitting. More than likely, he's sitting at the feet of Christ. You know what it means to sit at the feet of Christ? You know what it means to spend intimate time with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? One of my wife's favorite things in the world, <laughs> and now that I mention this, I'm going to be put up to it later tonight, is to have her feet rubbed. And you know what? When she says, honey, rub my feet, I don't know that I necessarily want to do it. <laughs> Not that her feet are nasty or anything. I guess feet are just gross in general. But... Um, not that I don't want to do it, but, but I'll do it because I love her. And, um, you know, eventually, you know, I, and I don't, I don't just do it halfway. I don't do one of these like, okay, you're done. <laughs> I'll put some effort into it. I work up a sweat kind of like right now. I mean, that's the best exercise in the world. And I'll rub her feet because I love her. And you know what? That's kind of some intimate time. And I love doing it. I just concentrate right there on her feet. And uh, she loves it, puts her at ease. Her feet hurt sometimes, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, I know why. Because she's always up on her feet, cooking and cleaning and changing diapers and, and loving me. But at someone's feet is one of the most intimate places you can be. And this man was sitting at the feet of Christ. What do you think he was doing there? You think he was tying up his shoes? Think he was tying up his sandals? Cleaning the rocks out of, out of, out of his sandals? Uh, no. I would, I would submit that he was learning from the greatest teacher to ever walk this earth. He was learning who Christ was. He was learning humility. He was learning to live for the master teacher. You know, in college sometimes, uh, I know this may be hard for you to believe, but sometimes in college when I went to class, um, I was kind of a goof off. I know that's, that's hard for some of you to believe. Um, my personality definitely dictates that I, I'm different now uh, than I was when I was in college several, several years ago. But uh, sometimes I cut up. And you know, because I goofed off, um, sometimes I missed out on some good teaching. Sometimes some really good teaching would go one in one ear and it'd go right out the other. Anyone ever had this problem? Was it just me? I don't know. Sometimes many important truths slipped right through my fingers because I was more worried about goofing off than I was about listening and studying and just paying attention like I was supposed to. And I guess if I had to do it all over again, I don't really have regrets, but if, but if I could do it again, I'd probably try and pay attention more. Notice I said probably. College was fun uh, sometimes when I goofed off, but I, I understand that I missed out on some great things. I understand because I wasn't paying attention all the time, I missed out on some really important things. But man, I, I wish I could go back sometimes and glean as much as I could from those godly men, some of those godly women who are my teachers. And I think the same is true with us Christians. So often we're tied up and we're, uh, we're caught up with the peripherals of life and we don't take time to sit at the master's feet and learn from him. We don't take time to open up his love letter to us and read it. We don't take time to learn who he is. We don't take time to learn about God. We don't take the time to learn who Christ is. And we're missing out. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're missing out on something great, something wonderful. And maybe you sit there and you think, oh, you know, I've got this point covered. You know, I, I sit at Jesus' feet. I come to church. Uh, sometimes I read my Bible. Um, yeah, but uh, what are you getting out of that time with God? Let me ask you this. Are you obeying his word? Are you obeying his word? Are you doing what he commands? Are you ministering to other people? Are you serving other people? What are you really learning from the master teacher? 
What are you really learning? Think about that for a second. Before you even attempt to contend with what I've said, what are you really learning from Christ? Listen, if the only learning you do is on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you've missed the boat. It's sailed without you. Uh, you're doing very basic, basic learning. Um, you're treating yourself like a baby Christian, and that's not what God has for us. The Bible tells us to grow up and take the meat of the word. Understand God's word. Live it. Love it. Learn it. Listen, the person who realizes that they need a changed position is the person who lives a humble life. The fads and the trends of this world do not shake the concentration of this person as they daily die and seek to learn more from the Lord. Their life is held in balance by the principles that God has ordained, and their goal in life is to glorify God by becoming more like him. Oh, that more Christians would sit at the feet of the master. Proper preparation for ministry has to do with a changed position. Not only that, but proper preparation for ministry involves a changed personality. And I'm almost out of time. I gotta talk quickly. This man wasn't focused on himself anymore. This man was focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we've already gone through it. Look who this man was before he met Christ. Running through the tomb, screaming at the top of his lungs, cutting himself, breaking chains, driving everyone nuts. No one could control him. All right, he was out there. Uh, he, was, he was weird. No one wanted anything to do with this guy. And look what happened to him after he met Christ. He realized that his only hope was in that man, Jesus Christ. Christ changed this man's personality. And I think this flies directly in the face of those who say, I can't tell other people about Jesus. That's just not my style. I don't have the gift of talking to people. You sound like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Oh, poor me. Oh, me, oh, my. I can't do it. Listen, if you're sitting there right now and that's your attitude, uh, maybe I need to start the message over because you weren't listening to the first part. Listen, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You, Christian person, got saved. You met Jesus Christ. When that happened, he determined that he was going to change you. And he wants to change you more and more every day into his image. And that person we were before, we keep going back to, and we keep going back to, and we keep using these excuses, and we keep saying, no, not me, I can't do it, and God says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. This man had a changed position, he had a changed personality, and thirdly, he had a changed passion. He had a changed passion. Proper preparation for ministry involves a changed passion. Notice verse 18. The Bible says, And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Where did this man want to be? He wanted to be as close to his Savior as he could possibly get. He wanted to be next to the master teacher. He wanted to be next close to the man who changed his personality. He wanted to be close to the man who taught him how to be a different person person. I wonder if that's your prayer tonight, that you want to be close to Christ. I wonder if that's your prayer, if that's, that's what you want tonight, is be close to the master teacher. I want you to think for a second. Look at the condition this guy was in before he was saved. Look how he was after he was saved. Do you think things were easy for him? Absolutely not. These people who basically hated this guy, now he had to minister to. Look, look at verse 19 says, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And what did this man do? He didn't just take that as a suggestion and say, Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Sure. Maybe after I change my clothes. Maybe, maybe after I, I shave my beard off. Maybe after I go back and I see my mom and dad again, I haven't seen them in a long time. They don't come to visit me in the, in the graveyard because I scream all the time when I see them. 
You know, maybe after that, yeah. No, that's not what he did. It says, and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. He marveled, yeah. And that was great. This man became a great witness. How great of a witness did this man become? Let me draw your attention over uh, to the book of Luke, chapter 8, very quickly. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 8. This is Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story right here. Luke, chapter 8, and uh, verse 40. The Bible says this, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. Now, does that tell you something about ministry? You know, when God orders something, he pays for it. When God commands you to do something, he's going to help you. You know, this man did not go in his own power. He went in the power of God. He went in the power of Christ. This man had the Holy Spirit within him. And no longer would he be possessed with demons because he was now possessed with the Holy Ghost. And he was under the influence of the master teacher. Understand that that is what Christ can do for you. Now, in, in, uh, in keeping up with uh, the rest of the pastoral staff here, I did have a handout prepared. Um, I know at this point we've run out of time, um, but let me say this. Uh, there's a sheet of paper on this back um, thingy over here. Uh, what is that, a cart? And uh, I want you to look at it. Um, let me tell you basically what it is. Um, it's kind of a guide for who to minister to. Uh, who to minister to. Um, this, this is not original with me. I got this from a mentor of mine. Uh, his name is Dave Jaspers. Many of you heard of him. Maybe heard him preach before. Uh, great guy. Um, I got this from him, and uh, it kind of gives us an idea of, um, looks like this, by the way, of who we can minister to. Uh, he uses this for evangelism. I, I've used it the same way, and I would, I would contend that these people that you believe you can minister to also need to be evangelized. Um, but it goes through uh, five things really quickly. It says relation, location, education, vocation, recreation. There's an evangelist always alliterating. Um, and then it has uh, ways to go about ministering to these people, prayer, point of contact, uh, plant the seed. It's got Bible verses with it. I want you to take one of those, and I want you to uh, take the time to fill that out. And the idea is, under relation, put those people who you're related to who you can minister to. Also, on top of that, I want you to put those people who you're related to who need Christ, who need to be saved. Uh, location, that talks about where you live, your neighborhood, education. Um, I've used this for teens, people you go to school with. Uh, but most of you in this room went to school, all right? I hope, I think. Uh, you probably may be still in touch with some of those people. Um, use this as an opportunity to talk to those people, to share God with them, to minister unto those people. Vocation, where you work, sharing God with coworkers. And recreation, the things that you do in your spare time, bowling league, I don't know what you do. Um, but whatever it is, uh, there is always an opportunity for us to share God. There is always an opportunity for us to minister. Always, always, always. So the question stands. Are you properly prepared to minister? Um, you should have no excuse not to minister. It's a biblical command, folks. It's commanded in Scripture that we minister unto other people, that we minister before God. Understand that proper preparation for ministry involves a changed position. It involves a changed personality, and it involves a changed passion. What is your passion? Is it, is it to be as close to the Savior as possible? Do you desire to be close to Christ? Is that your passion? Are you prepared to minister? Folks, let's be honest. I think it's time we get with it. I think it's high time we get with it. I think it's time we stop using excuses, and I think it's time we start living according to God's word. I think America as a nation has failed. I think our churches um, are just, a lot are just, have just been totally destroyed by liberalism. 
by new evangelicalism. I think a lot of conservative churches have been destroyed by lack of ministry. We need to get with it, folks. We need to implement Great Commission living. It needs to be our passion. It needs to be what we do. So the question stands, are you properly prepared for ministry? What are you doing to minister unto other people? What are you doing to serve other people? Or is your passion that you are to be served? Is your passion that somebody will serve you, take care of you, minister to you? What are you doing? What are we doing? Man, I can't preach this message without challenging myself. I can't. I just can't do it. Um, I think if we're honest, unless you haven't been listening, you have no choice but to be challenged. I'd like for us as a church body to understand what Christ has done for us, and I want us to implement that in our lives, and I want for us to become changed people. Listen, sanctification is a process. Growing closer to God is a process. It's, it's done over time. Um, and praise God that he's patient. Uh, praise God that um, uh, he gives us strength. But, folks, we need to do it. It's a command for every Christian. Are you doing your part tonight? Are you doing your part? Let's pray. Lord God, I do thank you again for this evening. And I thank you for the opportunity of reading your word. God, I thank you for this somewhat simple story of this demoniac at Gadara. God, I thank you for all the principles we can learn from this man, this man who, who was hopeless before he met you. God, I pray that none of us would consider ourselves hopeless, but God, that we would see that we can be changed by your power. God, we are changed at salvation, and you continue to change us. God, help us to be proper ministers. Help us to serve other people. And God, I pray as Pastor Cobb comes and closes the service that your spirit will move. And God, I pray that you would just continue to uh, make us more like you every day. For your name I pray. Amen. 663-663, make me a blessing.